one of the vilest war crimes ever committed. For a whole six weeks, the Imperial Japanese Army brutally sacked the old capital city of China, Nanking. No one was safe from the marauding soldiers of the Rising Sun, who ran amok through the city like rabid dogs. Men, women and children were massacred in their many thousands, the women in particular being subject to savage gang rapes. Even infant boys and girls were not immune from this treatment. Today, Descent into Darkness examines the disgusting, disgraceful and dishonourable savagery of the rape of Nanking. Before we get into the facts of today's video, I will just point out that, yes, I am fully aware that the city is called Nanjing nowadays, but I shall be using the old Romanized name of Nanking, because that's what it was called at the time in question. Anyway, allons-y, mes amis. For many hundreds of years under the highly militaristic shogunate that ruled Japan, the country had maintained a strict policy of isolationism. But all that was to change on the 8th of July, 1853. A fleet of US warships had suddenly arrived in Tokyo Bay under the command of Commodore Perry. He immediately issued an ultimatum to Japan, saying that if they refused to open to trade to the US, he would quite literally blast the ever-living hell out of the city. With little choice in the way of defensive options, the Japanese were forced to accept the USA's curt threat. By 1868, the shogunate had collapsed and the imperial government was restored under Emperor Meiji. Meiji oversaw a policy of rapid industrialization and total reorganization of the country's standing army into a more westernized type of fighting force. Gone were the bows, arrows and spears of the samurai to be replaced by modern rifles and units now formed along European lines with companies and regiments, etc. Given the astounding speed of Japan's embracement of not just military tactics, but in essence a whole new way of life, they had taken to it quite well. However, there were still some holdouts who preferred the old ways. This boiled over into a revolt in 1877 under Saigo Takamori, being dubbed the Satsuma Rebellion, the story of which is the inspiration behind the Tom Cruise film The Last Samurai, a very bloody good film. It does not take a genius to work out that the heavily traditionalist samurai were no real match for the new-style modern Japanese army, and the rebellion was crushed in less than nine months. Japan and China had first come to blows in 1895 in the First Sino-Japanese War, when the Empire of the Rising Sun had argued with China over who had political influence over the Korean Peninsula. The still highly outdated military of the Qing-ruled China had no chance against the comparatively highly modern Japanese. The war would only last nine months and ended in a resounding Japanese victory, cementing their hold over Korea and inflicting a crushing blow to China greatly shifting the balance of power in Asia. But the Japanese were nowhere near done yet with abusing their mainland neighbour. Throughout the first quarter of the 20th century, Japan had been slowly transforming itself into a major player on the global stage. It had already managed to negate one of the major threats to its expansion of power by signing a treaty with Great Britain in 1902 that had virtually guaranteed that no one would dare attack Japan without also bringing down the full might of the Royal Navy, and by extension, the French, as an ally of Britain, were also taken out of the threat equation. The Russians had been completely cowed in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, so they were unlikely to have another go any time soon either. That really only left the USA as a potential threat to their interests, but they weren't likely to intervene in matters that did not concern them. Oh, how times have changed on that one! <clears throat> With its national safety all but secured, Japan then set about modernising all aspects of her military might. The perennial problem, however, is that Japan has never been particularly flush with many natural resources, such as coal, rubber, oil, iron ore, or other metals or commodities. The emperor's government knew that if they were to realise their aspirations of greatness, they would need to aggressively expand their territory. The major flaw in the plan would end up being that the policy was self-fulfilling. The more territory they seized, the more resources they would need to hold and maintain it, and therefore needed to seize more land. 
Whilst they knew that they would never be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any of the major European powers or the USA, they knew that they would be able to make gains from their immediate neighbours in Asia, most notably China and Korea. Japanese military doctrine was heavily based around the ancient samurai tradition of Bushido, a way of conducting oneself that is dedicated to the way of war and the warrior. To this end, all Japanese officers and NCOs were issued with a katana-type sword called a shingunto, a symbol of their authority and a signal to their subordinates that their word was absolute and respect and loyalty demanded, just like the samurai in the days of yore. Japanese enlisted men could expect to be treated very harshly by their superiors, with beatings being dished out for the most incongruous of infractions. Deeply rooted in a culture of supposed honour and dignity, this code of conduct was only really applied internally. Those who were unfortunate enough to fall under their oppressive yoke were not to be accorded honourable treatment. Quite the opposite. Captured enemy soldiers were seen as particularly loathsome as they had allowed themselves to be taken prisoner rather than fighting to the death or committing suicide instead. To be taken captive was seen as dishonourable in Bushido and were thus treated with extreme scorn and brutality. They were taught that it was better to commit suicide rather than be taken hostage. This you will no doubt be familiar with as the ritual of seppuku, sometimes alternately called harakiri, whereby one uses a short sword or knife to cut your own stomach, upon which a friend would then end your suffering by cutting off your head with his sword. Civilians of conquered territory were seen only as a bank of slave labour to be exploited to the maximum. Their lives, expendable. It's not like they couldn't just get more. China has been a victim of perennial exploitation pretty much ever since Marco Polo allegedly discovered it all the way back in 1271, although it must be pointed out, of course, that the Chinese definitely discovered it first. The British Empire had established trade with China for the manufacture and export of tea, and more controversially, opium. This latter product had been a source of much contention as the Chinese had had it forced upon them that they would be growing it. This had led to the near three-year conflict between 1839 and 1842, as the Qing dynasty government had outright banned the substance due to its detrimental effects on society. Of course, Britain was never going to allow such a profitable crop from being banned, and so threw its might against the Chinese government. Naturally, the overwhelming might of the empire had forced a surrender, and Britain was allowed to build five more trading ports, chief amongst which was Shanghai. They also gained Hong Kong in the treaty, and thus the opium supply was restored. Except, of course, this only lasted until 1856, when tension had escalated to war again. One of the reasons for this second conflict was the insidious desire of Britain to expand even further, as it was felt that the outcome of the previous war had been insufficient in their favour. This time, Britain was joined by France and the United States in their fight against understandable Chinese hostility. This second opium war would last until 1860, and would see even more territory ceded to Britain, including the Kowloon Peninsula and an expansion of the land held around Hong Kong. An insurrection had begun in 1899, led by a group that went by the incredibly badass name of the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists. This group was known to practice martial arts, and were thus dubbed the Boxers by the British. To combat this, and to, of course, defend their lucrative trade interests, a huge confederation of, of countries came together to help the Qing government crush the rebellion. Britain, France, Germany, the USA, Japan, Belgium, the Netherlands, Austria-Hungary, Russia, Italy, and even Spain had all converged on China to deal with the boxers. The Chinese themselves had initially helped, but in 1900, a year after the start of the rebellion, they switched sides and began resisting the Allied forces. A year later, the Allies had won, and the reprisals were brutal. Many captured rebels were executed in some nasty ways, including some being secured in wooden cages that forced them to stand up with their necks being secured tightly at the top. When they could no longer stand, and their legs gave way, they slowly strangled to death. <laughs> 
that a huge swathe of China's eastern coast was now in the control of the Allied nations. It would not be until the rise of the Chinese Communist Party that the power of the West would be directly challenged again. But the severely troubled China once again exploded in rebellion, in the death of Empress Cixi in late 1908, and her successor being her two-year-old son, Puyi. This uprising had begun in 1911, known as the Xinhai Rebellion, forced the six-year-old Puyi to abdicate in January of 1912, which ended the 300-year rule of the Qing dynasty, and by extension, over 2,000 years of imperial rule in China, when it declared itself a republic. Of course, there would still be more bloodshed between 1919 and 1928. Various factions found themselves vying for the top spot at the head of China, until finally the country was reunified under the military forces of Chiang Kai-shek. Japan invaded the province of Manchuria in the north of China on the 18th of September 1931. It had already had a foothold in the south of the area, as this had been gifted to Japan in exchange for helping them kick the Germans out of China during the First World War. The ever toothless League of Nations did virtually nothing to stop Japan's invasion of the rest of Manchuria. They had imposed sanctions on Japan, but in response, they had simply proverbially flipped them off and walked out of the League. Once Manchuria was fully secured, by the 27th of February 1932, the territory fell under the direct rule of the Imperial Japanese Army, rather than government. The Japanese installed a puppet administration under the former Qing Emperor Puyi and referred to the area as Manchukuo. Very soon, Chinese citizens were being forced into slave labour to extract raw materials or work in hastily constructed factories in the occupied areas already under the Japanese yoke. Of course, the whole reason for Japan's territory grab required more and more resources to sustain itself, and it wouldn't be long before the rest of China came under threat. The Second Sino-Japanese War broke out following a false flag attack on a Japanese-held railway bridge, which gave them the manufactured excuse to invade the rest of China. They had taken advantage of the civil war ongoing in China between the government forces and the upstart communist supporters. However, the two bitter factions had agreed to put their differences aside to fight the common enemy. Sadly, despite the bulk of the forces being armed with modern small arms, their training had left a lot to be desired, and their command structure was fractured and the temporary allies deeply distrusting each other, leading to the left hand not knowing what the right was doing. The much more rigidly structured and highly trained Japanese, despite being massively outnumbered, were still able to roll right over the Chinese forces, sweeping them aside with relative ease. By the 9th of November 1937, the Army of the Rising Sun had breached the last lines of defence around the city of Nanking, causing the remaining Chinese defenders to capitulate. Right, there's going to be some highly shocking images in this section, but they serve to illustrate the truth of what happened. So here we go. When the Japanese, under the overall command of Emperor Hirohito's own son, Prince Asaka, entered the city, the soldiers were simply allowed to go completely wild and have their fill of the spoils of war. Civilians were summarily shot and bayoneted in the streets, or wherever they were found hiding. Women, no matter how old they were, were brutally gang-raped by hundreds of men before they too were killed. Even after death, the corpses were further defiled. Sticks would be violently shoved into the vagina and left standing upright, whilst the bodies would just simply be left naked on display, sometimes in the middle of the streets. Even young children and infants were not immune to this treatment. The very youngest girls had had their vaginas cut to allow the men easier entry. The sex-starved soldiers took any opportunity they got to rape. There were even reports of soldiers forcing boys to rape their mothers and sisters for their amusement. Conservatively, it is estimated that around 20,000 people, adults and children, were raped, the majority of them multiple times. <laughs> 
Gangs of soldiers, formerly organised units of troops, stalked the streets of Nanking, going house to house and exploring every possible hiding place, looking for more civilians. When a new female was found, well, you know what happened next. Even the elderly and infirmed would be thoroughly violated also. Children and infants were bayoneted multiple times or were battered to death with rifle butts. Babies were taken by the ankles and bashed against the wall. People were soaked in petrol or kerosene and set on fire while still alive, and some were forced to step on landmines or hold grenades that had their pins pulled. Japanese officers were far from immune from the depravity either. Very quickly, a competition was established and bets taken to see who could kill 100 people first with their swords. Of course, the officers took to this ghoulish contest with an eager attitude, hoping to win and scoop up some major moolah. There seemed to be no end to the slaughter and the disgraceful, depraved actions of the Japanese soldiers. The banks of the Yangtze River were soon littered with thousands of bloated, rotting bodies. The days turned into weeks, and still there was no let-up in the animalistic behaviour. The only place that offered anything like a modicum of safety was inside a zone in the middle of the city that was established by foreign nationals of other countries whose diplomatic status gave them some degree of protection. But given that this area was completely surrounded, getting to it was no mean achievement. The words Nazi and hero appearing in the same sentence are very much an oxymoron, save for a very few standout examples. Of course, one cannot forget the acts of Oskar Schindler for his attempts to save the members of his Jewish forced workforce in his factories, some 1,200 souls. But there is another who deserves equal praise for his humanitarian actions. Step forward and take a bow, Jan Rabe. A native of Hamburg, Rabe and his wife Dora had first made their way to China in 1908 and had begun working for the Asian division of the German company Siemens in 1910, where he had quickly managed to gain notoriety amongst the expat German society. Prior to the First World War, Germany had owned a massive trading port at Tsingtao and had contracted to supply the Chinese army with modern weaponry such as Mauser-designed rifles. Rabe eventually rose to the dizzying heights of managing director of Siemens Asia, and he and his wife moved to Nanking in 1931. He kept abreast of the developing situation back home in Germany, and no doubt once he saw which way the wind was firmly blowing, he joined the Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, or Nazi Party, in 1934, soon becoming an ardent, supportive voice of the regime. He was quoted as saying, I believe not only in the correctness of our political system, but, as an organiser of the party, I stand behind the system 100%. This resounding rubber stamp of approval of one of the evilest regimes that has ever existed is quite at odds with Raab's later good deeds, but then again, show me someone who isn't a hypocrite. Given his social status, it will come as no surprise to learn that Raab soon became the highest-ranking Nazi in China essentially becoming Germany's main man in the country, an ambassador in all but name. As the Japanese forces closed in on Nanking, Rabe sent summons to a handful of Westerners that still remained in the city. He received replies from 14 individuals, and they all met up with Rabe. He was adamant that something must be done to protect the people. The upshot of this meeting was the decision and resolve to establish a safety zone in the middle of the city. This zone would be centred rather conveniently around Rabe's house and the German school that he had established a couple of years previously. The zone would be surrounded by white flags of neutrality and would cover around two and a half square miles. Before the city fell, he plastered the city in posters informing the inhabitants about the safety zone. To emphasise his neutral status in the conflict and to remind the Japanese of who their allies were, Rabe also had swastikas painted on every building and rooftop that he could. Because nothing says, hey, I'm the good guy here, like a bunch of Nazi symbols. Nevertheless, it worked. The Japanese were, for the most part, respectful of the safety zone. Around a quarter of a million people flooded into the zone as the shells began to fall all around. 
The area soon became a massive makeshift shanty town with people making rudimentary shelters out of whatever they could find, most sleeping out in the open air. Raba also offered shelter to fleeing Chinese soldiers on the sole condition that they discarded all of their weapons. When the Japanese heard of this, they sent a representative named Katsuo Okazaki to ask Raba for these men to be handed over. He assured Raba that these men would come to no harm. With this assurance and thorough belief that the Japanese would keep their word, Yon agreed. Unfortunately, this would lead to many innocent people being hauled out of the safety zone. The Japanese looked for men who had calloused fingers as a sign of them carrying small arms. Sadly, many of the thousands that were rooted out were in fact rickshaw drivers, who also just happened to have deeply calloused hands. All of these men were dragged out of the safety zone, lined up against the wall, and shot. This event, along with the increasing reports of the atrocities taking place outside of the city, had led Robert to constantly petition the Japanese commanders to halt the madness, but he was ignored. Even when he contacted Berlin to demand help, he was still ignored. With these insurmountable odds stacked against him and the people inside the zone under his protection, Raba decided to take matters into his own hands. In an act that could quite well be considered potentially suicidal, Raba, dressed in his full Nazi party uniform, started to venture out into the city every day and look for Chinese citizens and escort them to the safety zone. He would brazenly storm up to groups of Japanese soldiers who were abusing someone and angrily bark at them in true stereotypical uber-Germanic style. Amazingly, the natural subservience of the normal Japanese soldiers to any form of authority made them obey, and they moved on. Raba repeated this trick hundreds of times day after day. In doing so, many more lives were saved and brought back to the relative safety of his self-imposed sanctuary. The massacre was finally brought to a halt and some semblance of order restored, but this took a whole six weeks to achieve. Six weeks of shocking, disgraceful and savage barbarity. Of course, this did not fully stop after this period, but it did lessen significantly. The Japanese had the sheer brass neck to proudly announce that order had been restored by the army. Following the Japanese surrender on the 15th of August 1945, the Allied powers came to learn of the full extent of the Japanese atrocities throughout the whole time of their aggressive territorial expansionist era. The disgusting criminal act disguised as medical research of Unit 731 being of particular extra note, and absolutely the topic of a video for another day. Generals Iwane Matsui and Hisao Tani were indicted for war crimes at the International Military Court for the Far East. Both men were hanged. Nobody else in the Japanese High Command would face justice for what happened at Nanking. Even Prince Asaka was granted immunity pr from prosecution, most likely due to his famous daddy. Who says history doesn't repeat itself? The humanitarian acts of Yon Raba is thought to have saved the lives of around a quarter of a million people, far in excess of his contemporary Oscar Schindler, making Raba one of the greatest humanitarians of all time, and yet barely anyone has ever heard of him. Rather incongruously, he remained fiercely loyal to Adolf Hitler's regime. Robert would return to Germany soon after the massacre had ended, taking with him a whole litany of damning photographs and film reel of the whole sordid affair. He was immediately arrested upon his return by the infamous Geheimstaatspolizei, the Gestapo, for antagonising their Japanese allies. He would have been executed for it too, had his boss at Siemens not used his influence to spare his life. When he was released, Raba would never attain the high level of importance he once had, being forced to take up very low-level clerical job within the company. His membership of the Nazi party would see him arrested once more at the end of the war by the Allied authorities. He did stand trial, but was acquitted, largely thanks to the testimony of one of his co-conspirators in the establishment of the safety zone, an American doctor named Wilson. Raba was released from jail once more in 1946. He died a poverty-stricken persona non grata from a stroke in January of 1950 at the age of 68, his deeds now mostly forgotten.
having been written out of mainstream history thanks to the Chinese communist regime. Only the surviving residents of Nanking, whom he helped to save, would remember the great work of John Rabba. And they certainly never forgot what happened to them over the six grueling weeks in the rape of Nanking. The events of the Nanking Massacre themselves are quite possibly the worst single war crime outside of the Nazi death camps. The final butcher's bill may never well be known. The estimates vary wildly, anywhere from between two to four hundred thousand. Two to four hundred thousand innocent lives, so brutally cut short by a bunch of out-of-control savages that so hypocritically operated under the guise of a pseudo-honour system that only applied to their own. No truly honourable men would ever entertain the thought of committing any of the despicable acts that occurred in Nanking. It is an horrific indictment of just what humans are capable of if they are convinced that their perceived enemies are portrayed as subhuman. You know you've done something truly disgusting and disgraceful when even the actual Nazis are shocked by it. I can highly recommend the film The Flowers of War starring Christian Bale, this brilliant film really highlights the atrocities committed by the Japanese soldiers in this darkest of times in history. In modern-day Japan, the massacre is very much a sore point of national shame. Most do not want to talk about it, and there are some that flatly deny that it had ever happened, perhaps because they genuinely cannot believe that their ancestors would be so barbaric. This more extreme reaction is akin to Holocaust denial, and as such is an abhorrent position to take but the photographs taken at the time speak louder than words ever could. In the 1990s, Jan Rabba's gravestone was taken from Berlin and reinterred in modern-day Nanjing at the gigantic memorial to the massacre that he helped to stop. If ever there was a person more fitting of the title of hero, then Jan Rabba ranks right up there with the best of them. If you can do something good, why hesitate? Jan Rabba, 1882 to 1950. China had not seen the last of its bloodshed, though, as the communist struggle restarted even before the dust had a chance to settle. The government forces under Chiang Kai-shek were eventually defeated by the Red Forces under Mao Zedong in 1949, and still the blood continued to flow under the new communist regime's so-called Great Leap Forward, and the ongoing systematic eradication of the Uyghur Muslims but these are tales for another day. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative and entertaining. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps with boosting the channel out into the ether. I'd love to know what you think, so please drop a comment down below and I'll happily reply to as many of you as I can. If you wish to do so, you can now support DID on Patreon or via the Super Thanks button, link in the description. Don't forget that all Patreon members now have the opportunity to arrange a private free walking tour around the city of York if you're ever up this way. 2,000 years of history, all presented to you by yours truly. You can't whack a deal like that. How many other YouTubers offer anything like that? Exactly. It's just me. Don't forget to check out the DID merch store and pick yourself up a sweet tea, hoodie or a mug and help fly the flag for all to see. And in the meantime, take care of yourselves and I will see you on our next descent into darkness.